Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, I guess we'll get started. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Fire and Dicom Web. Uh, my name is Brad Jenneru. Uh, by day, I'm a product manager at Agva Healthcare, and then also uh, Mahanad will be uh, presenting with uh, with me to go through some of the exercises that we prepared today. Um, so uh, aside from uh, uh, working in product management, uh, I also do a lot of work with uh, standards and interoperability. Uh, I'm co-chair for HL7 Imaging Integration, as well as uh, co-chair of a couple of DICOM working groups, working group 20 on the integration of imaging and information systems, i.e. HL7, uh, as well as co-chair of working group 27 on web technologies. Um, so. Just a quick show of hands. How many people were here yesterday for the DICOM introduction? Okay, so about half. All right, great. Uh, everyone knows what DICOM is, I take it? Hands up. Hands up if you don't know DICOM? All right. All right, that's good. Uh, how many people think DICOM is scary? <laughs> great, okay. I, I work very hard to demystify that uh, to make sure that it's not that scary. So. Um, after the session, if you want to drop by and talk with us about imaging, we're set up in the, at the imaging table. We'll be here all week. Uh, also, there's some great sessions this afternoon on IHE, uh, which also touch upon imaging as well. So the, the point of this session is to talk about the convergence of Fire and DICOM Web, how they relate together, how it actually uh, intersects into the workflow of imaging inside of a hospital. Uh, we're going to keep it interactive. Uh, we've got some exercises and then questions at the end if there's time. So a, a quick recap from yesterday, uh, the need for imaging everywhere. This is what DICOM Web is all about. And when we talk about imaging, we're looking at more than just diagnostic imaging. We're looking at procedural imaging. So this is imaging that's done in the emergency department uh, or uh, in the OR, uh, capturing images, but we may not actually be uh, storing them lar uh, long term for diagnostic purposes to be read by a radiologist. Uh, we're also looking at evidence imaging. So here, for example, if someone has surgery and we're tracking the progression of the wound for uh, recovery, we could take a picture every uh, two days for two weeks uh, and watch that transition and make sure that the patient is healing okay. And the, the last group is really looking at how we image enable clinical reports. Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. We look at enterprise imaging, uh, which is a, a term that covers the strategy initiatives and workflows uh, around managing images. Uh, so to capture, index, manage, store, distribute, view, exchange, and analyze all clinical imaging, regardless of its origin, uh, to enhance the electronic health record. There's a great white paper uh, that was uh, put together. It's an open access in the Journal of Digital Imaging, uh, put together uh, through a collaboration of HIMSS and SIM, which is the Society for Imaging Informatics and Medicine. So as I said, uh, worth a thousand words. <laughs> I grabbed a, a quote from a paper from uh, 15 years ago. I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, you can see that this, uh, this Latin is greatly enhanced by the presence of imaging. So. Uh, a Google mantra, if I can't find it, it doesn't exist. Uh, that's true in healthcare. It's certainly true in imaging. And when we have to re-image the patient because we don't have the images, it's, it's bad. It's bad for the patient. Uh, increased risk because they ought to be, if we're using uh, radiation, uh, the more exposure is, uh, can lead to uh, cancer, essentially. Uh, also, by bringing the patient back into the hospital, we also expose them to po possible hospital-borne infections. There's increased cost to the patient uh, and to the healthcare system. There's uh, increased patient discomfort if we have to use contrast uh, or bend them in funny ways to get the, the perfect image, as well as anxiety, uh, worried about the exams, and not only for the patients, but also their caregivers, for their family members as well. Uh, we delay the patient because they, uh, they came to, uh, you know, uh, they're being treated, but we need to, to pause treatment while we acquire images. Um, and then also delay for other patients as a backs up the system for all this unnecessary re-imaging of patients. When we look at the imaging department workflow, so very basically, and there are many, many derivatives and different directions that this could go, but essentially the patient comes to the hospital, uh, a doctor creates an order, the referring or attending physician. The order gets reviewed for completion, make sure that it's appropriate. Uh, the images get acquired, so the patient goes into the scanner there uh, and we acquire images. Uh, radiologists will write a report, and then that report is given to the uh, referring or attending physician uh, for follow-up, uh, which contains usually a differential diagnosis, 
Uh, and uh, then the physician then determines what the next steps actually are. Uh, so you think about, for example, a patient comes in with uh, a major headache and we want to check for brain bleeds. Uh, this is critical to get that information across as soon as possible if we need to uh, intervene for the patient uh, for their life. But the use cases around imaging are evolving. Uh, so we, we see this, uh, you know, as a response, uh, well, fire is a response to some of these things that have been uh, uh, causing use cases to change, uh, but uh, uh, also in imaging as well. So we see things like patient-centered care, being able to get the images to the patients, the patients own the images. Uh, enterprise imaging, looking beyond just radiology imaging, as I mentioned. We want to get images onto mobile devices, so onto the, app, the iPads and tablets and iPhones, so, because clinicians are mobile. Uh, we're looking more at using cloud services and service-oriented architectures. Uh, there's a move to value-based care and meaningful use. I, I come from Canada, so it's a little bit different uh, up there, but uh, uh, value-based care is certainly still important worldwide. And then we also see, you know, with more computing power uh, and more network speeds, we're able to do more things more quickly. So if you don't know what DICOM was, DICOM is imaging. It's the standard for handling, storing, printing, and transmitting information in medical imaging, and it's both a file structure as well as a communication protocol. There is a hierarchy to DICOM where we have uh, each patient will contain uh, X number of studies, and each study contains Y number of series, so a run of images on the patient uh, for a particular modality. And each of those series may contain one or more instances or images uh, acquired for that particular series. So for example, if you think about a CT study, which is slices of the body, it'll be one series with multiple images. And each of these uh, instances will have metadata attached. And there are going to be different metadata at each of those levels. So at the study level, we would have the, the date of the study, the ID of the study, the description. Uh, we'd have who the referring physician was, the accession to connect it back to the order. The series will have its own set of metadata, and the instances have their own set of data, uh, metadata as well. And each of the DICOM instances contains a complete set of this metadata. So every single instance that's generated has all of this, so that when we distribute it, it's a full package. So that's the recap. Let's talk about how fire comes into the picture and how it relates to medical imaging. When we look at what constitutes the health record, the health record can, uh, really consists of three components. Uh, HL7, or discrete data, uh, DICOM, for imaging data, uh, and then documents, uh, which could be XDS, it could be uh, many different things, uh, depending on uh, who's generated the document and, and how it moves about. And there's a lot of, uh, you can see the dates to how old some of this technology is. DICOM started in 83, but the version that we know today is from 1993. Uh, and then HL7 has gone through its uh, iterations. And we see different things in, in the document space as well. But it's really these three pieces that uh, form the health record. Each of them is critical to uh, a, a healthcare record for a patient. So the question that, I, that comes up to me all the time is when do I use which? So because we have FHIR, which has an imaging study resource, and we have DICOM Web, which is really a deeper dive into the uh, images that are being generated. So we use FHIR when we're looking at uh, coming from an information-centric application. So as an example, in a health record, in an EMR, an EHR, we would use imaging study in FHIR to really understand the existence of what DICOM studies are available. When, when we present this l list of studies in the EHR, Imaging study gives you all the information that you need and connects it back to the rest of the information model. You've got the patient, you've got the order, you've got the diagnostic report, all bundled within that imaging study resource. When we need to go deeper into the images and do things like post-processing uh, or uh, we want to do a 3D reconstruction off a CT study if we want to uh, fly through the colon or, or all sorts of really cool things with images, we use DICOM and DICOM Web because the data that's collected as part of the acquisition process contains far more than what a typical JPEG image would, would have. Uh, so for example, if you think about a patient going through a CT machine, again, this stack of every slice of your body, 
we need to know uh, exactly uh, in the half millimeter space where the patient was for each of those slices. And that's not something that we collect as part of a, a JPEG or a PNG metadata. So fire information, DICOM web imaging. We work very closely, HL7 and DICOM, to make sure that we are aligned so that we're not stepping on each other's toes, to make sure that uh, we're not duplicating use cases or standards, uh, so that we make sure we meet the needs of everyone in our respective communities. So uh, with that, we have uh, II, Imaging Integration, and then Working Group 20, the Integration of Imaging and Information Systems, uh, which uh, we work together. Uh, so co-chaired by me, as well as my uh, colleague at Change Healthcare, his name is Elliot Silver, who is also here this week. So uh, another hot topic that, that people often uh, debate with me on is, why not just fire? Why not we just get rid of DICOM and DICOM? There was a question yesterday where, where a gentleman asked in the audience saying, What's, you know, when are we gonna get rid of DICOM so that we can uh, just use fire? The, there's problems with that. So if you think about a, a scale, um, scaling into the millions, the billions, the trillions, uh, and also uh, managing backwards compatibility. These are the two big reasons why. So DICOM, uh, one of the most widely deployed healthcare messaging standards in the world, uh, probably second to only HL7. Uh, hundreds of thousands of devices, so CR, CTs, MRI machines, producing images that are decades in production. We have two trillion files generated annually. 50% of those is in the US, the other 50% worldwide. 450 petabytes per year. So that's, if you think about megabytes, uh, gigabytes, petabytes, right? Uh, so 450 of those per year, uh, doubling every five years. And currently today we have 4.5 exabytes, which is uh, the next step up from petabytes. Uh, images created back in 1993 are still perfectly used in today's technologies without changing anything. Uh, so 25 years of images that we can go back and open up uh, in any DICOM viewer today. So it would be, if we said, let's, let's dump DICOM and switch to fire, massive effort, not much value, not much need, or not much industry support. If we think about uh, the modalities that are in the, the world today, uh, you basically, like the Ronco model of set it and forget it. You install a CR, great. You don't touch it for 20 years. So let's talk about uh, imaging study for a little bit. So, uh, imaging study is the fire resource for imaging. Um, if we look at the, again, uh, the workflow, right? Patient comes to the hospital, we get an order, order gets reviewed, we acquire the images, we write the report, and we distribute the results. If we were to map that onto fire, right? So there we go, visit, order, protocol, acquire, report, access. We can map those, uh, there's, you know, there's our use case. Uh, we map them onto fire resources. We can see that we've got en encounters, the service request for the order, the service request to help us protocol what we're actually trying to do with the order. Uh, we uh, acquire images via a procedure. Uh, we write a report using diagnostic report. Uh, and then we uh, publish the structure of the imaging study using imaging study uh, that we could then use for accessing that. What's key uh, and really important note to drive home. Uh, if you know the, if you've taken part in, in Lloyd's workflow discussions, imaging study is an event uh, and it maps onto the event uh, uh, abstract model, but don't be fooled because it's very easy to say imaging study, ah, oh, that's when we got images of the patient, but that's not what imaging study is. Imaging study is more around the imaging data being available on disk. Uh, and not acquiring the images from the patient. The, the order, we can equate that to service request. The acquisition, the act of ac acquiring the images, you can equate that to procedure. If we look at the actual uh, fire resource for imaging study, uh, you can see that we've got, oh, can I use my mouse here? There we go, okay. So we've got the, the main part of the uh, resource, which is imaging study. Uh, each imaging study, as we know from the hierarchy, contains a number of series, and each of those series contains a number of instances. A very simplistic uh, you know, example, what studies do you have for John Doe? I make a fire request, I get back 
a JSON or XML of whatever imaging studies are available for that patient. The XML probably hard, difficult to read, but uh, you can see that we've got uh, the information, for example, a reference to the, there's my mouse, sorry. Oh, did I hit back? Oh, there, okay. A reference to the, uh, there's the, to the patient, the subject there, when we did it, uh, the series that are contained, it's a CT exam, what part of the body it was, the upper trunk, um, you can see uh, that it contains, this one contains one image only. Uh, so you've got a lot of details there on what uh, uh, this is actually about, the accession number, the order, how it connects into the rest of the health record. Uh, a little bit of a deeper dive, now looking at the various components. So uh, this is the study part of imaging study. Uh, you can see that we've got the identifiers, uh, we've got the modality, what equipment we use to acquire the images, uh, the encounter, uh, the, why the patient or how the patient is here, what encounter does it re relate to, uh, the order, we've got a connection to the order, we have the who read the study or who's going to read the study, why we did the study, uh, we've got uh, the retrieval location, which I'll talk to in a minute. This is our connection to DICOM web. Uh, and then other things like the ordering physician, the procedure, and any notes as well. Uh, the next part is a series, uh, which here is, so this is a run of images. If you think about an imaging study, we might do a run of images uh, without contrast and a run of images with contrast to actually see the difference. Uh, we might do a thick slice CT, uh, so every a half uh, centimeter, and then a thin slice CT. Uh, and there's lots of different reasons why we do those different things. So a study will have multiple series sometimes. Uh, and uh, we've got the series description, uh, where to go to get it, uh, what part of the body, the side of the body, et cetera. Uh, and then the instance part, which contains really just the identifiers and the type of object that it happens to be. It could be a JPEG, like an, like an image image. It could be a video. It could be a markup object. Uh, it could be a, a key object selection document. It could be a dichomized report. Uh, it could be measurements. The instances could be a lot of different things, and that type of object tells you what it happens to be. Uh, the last critical part, uh, and this is just one of the attributes in imaging study, uh, is the endpoint resource. So this is what tells you how to get the images. So you, you know that it exists, how do you go and get it? Uh, so endpoint uh, tells you the base, re or the base URL of where to go and get those images. So for example, you'll see that we've got uh, the DICOM Watto RS uh, connection type, uh, which is the RESTful call to retrieve uh, the study series or instances. Uh, we also have uh, for legacy uh, web, which is Waddle URI. Uh, and then we also have a couple of others. If you want to query to learn more about the study, there's a keto endpoint. Uh, and then also there is something called IID, which is an IHE profile for invoking image display. This is what we use to embed a viewer inside of another application like an EMR or EHR. So uh, what does a URL actually look like? Right, so if we look at a Watto RS call, we can pull that down from the address, uh, and then we use the identifiers found in the rest of the imaging study object to construct a URL. Uh, one of the things that we struggled with early on when doing this resource is, why don't we just put the URL in all of the instances? Uh, in the case of a 10,000 slice CT, uh, we will have 10,000 plus URLs in that resource uh, and they're all pretty much the same, minus a slight change identifier. Uh, so uh, we thought, and the other thing too is that you typically not use that URL by itself. You're going to ask for additional parameters, like I want it this size, or I want uh, it in a JPEG or in PNG format, which you can do with DICOM Web. Uh, so we split this up so that you build it yourself however you actually need to uh, do to satisfy your use cases. So let's look at a couple of use cases in the real world, right? So I've talked a little bit about uh, image enabling the EMR, right? So we can use imaging study to discover what records exist and then use DICOM web to actually retrieve the image. Uh, and if you want to use a zero footprint viewer uh, with something like IID, uh, if that's available to you, go for it. But 
you may not want to do that from the outset. We might actually want to grab thumbnails that you use inside of your EMR, and then if they want to view the whole study, to uh, dip down into a viewer. It is a slippery slope because, you know, if we just said, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just grab a couple of the JPEGs and pull them up on the page and the doctor will be happy, that's not true. Uh, we need to be able to do some advanced functionality like uh, layering on markup if someone's drawn arrows or circles around uh, critical parts of the anatomy. Uh, if we need to do window leveling, so if you think about the old days, if I've got a piece of film, I hold it up to the light, I move it forward and backwards, we have the equivalent in the digital world called window level, uh, and, you, and clinicians absolutely need to be able to set that. Uh, as well as you know things like 3D, if I want to take a, a run of slices and actually model it in 3D, uh, some clinicians do that for, for some of their use cases. So great to start, uh, but uh, there's more to it. So here's a quick example. Uh, so if I want to, let's say I want to put an image inside of my EMR for a thumbnail, right? If you think about uh, a patient's got 10 studies and uh, someone is coming to say, oh, this guy fractured his hand, I want to find the hand study. It is far more easier to use a picture than to use uh, just a list, right? So I can make uh, a call to discover uh, what imaging studies are, exist for a patient. So here's my imaging study for patient one, two, three, four, five. And you'll see that I have got the endpoint for this study. I've got the ID references as well. I turn that into a WADORS call. Uh, you can see how it just maps. I've got the server address, study series instance. Uh, I'm saying I want a thumbnail by saying viewport equals 50 comma 50. Uh, it's URI encoded. And I said I want a JPEG uh, because I can display JPEGs fairly easily. Right? There's lots of caveats here. <laughs> it's not as easy as it, as it looks, obviously. You have to think about things like authentication, authorization, if there's firewalls in the way, if there's it's a, you're calling a national archive. There's lots of things to think about. The other piece that's lost a little bit is that the thumbnail's relevant. So imagine, if you will, I've done a CT study of the head. Right? So I go from the top of my head, the sliver of the, of the what used to be hair on my head, all the way down my head. Uh, if I were to grab the first series and the first instance, I'm going to get this, which for a clinician doesn't really tell you what part of the body that is, right? A clinician, if you ask them, will say, oh, that's what I want to see. I want to see somewhere one third or two thirds of the way of the stack. But it depends on lots of things. So what DICOM has done, uh, we've listened to the, to the FHIR uh, community feedback uh, and put in a thumbnail API. So you could just say study slash thumbnail, and it'll return what it thinks is the best thumbnail to give to you. Uh, it's final text, but not yet in the actual uh, standard if you go to the website. It's still waiting to be brought in as part of the editorial cycle. So very new. Uh, another use case, uh, image enabling reports. So here, if I want to, uh, you know, I've got a study, I want to add images, uh, I can just, you know, request the, the report, request some images, fantastic. When we acquire images on a patient, uh, so the patient goes to the, uh, you know, to the CT room, uh, and the tech is going to say, okay, I'm going to image you, they're typically only Typically, they're only given a sheet of paper, say, I got to acquire this, or they're looking at some sort of work list. Being able to fire enable those work lists to tell us things like allergies, why are we actually imaging this patient, and that background is critical to uh, making sure that that patient is given the appropriate care that they need. So we can use DICOM Web, get the work list, and then enrich it with patient metadata. I'm going to kind of speed things up a little bit. Um, AI, another key part. We're seeing AI being done in the information space and AI being done in the imaging space. But where those worlds intersect will be critical. Uh, you need both sides of the house to really drive uh, advanced uh, augmented intelligence. Uh, and then lastly, just a quick touch uh, upon IHE. There are a number of profiles uh, that use Fire and DICOM Web, WIC, WIA. If you know XDSI, it used to be DICOM Web, and it's a very long story. Uh, we have uh, the Rheology reporting workflow as well as IID. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mohanad, uh, who will walk us through a couple of fire imaging study uh, exercises. There you go. Thank you, Brad. All right. 
Um, as usual, these exercises are on the website, so feel free to try them on later. Uh, Brad and I will be at the uh, imaging track table up upstairs if you have any questions or any concerns. Uh, that being said, let me see. Perfect, that brings it up. Okay. Now, first thing to know is that we actually have a typo here. Uh, there was a, a little space, so just watch out for that. But the rest of this should work. So I'm going to start really simple. We're going to start with what most of you should by now know. I'm just simply going to go look at this one patient here. Okay. Make sure I remove that space. And while that loads, I'll quickly elaborate. So you'll notice in the URL, I've got hackathon.sim.org. So these are servers hosted by SIM, um, an organization here out of the States um, concerned with uh, medical imaging. Um, we are right now using an API key, a generic API key that you'll see called hackathon orientation session. Uh, if any of you would like to continue hacking using SIM servers, um, this API key will be valid for the duration of this conference. After the conference, you're more than welcome to request your API key. It's free, no strings attached. Um, and I'm more than happy to show you how you can sign up for one. It's, uh, it's pretty easy. Now, that being said, um, you notice, you know, again, this is fire, nothing new here. Oops, my bad. Um, it's returning some information about the patient in here. Now, of course, depending on the implementation, um, some servers will actually return information about the um, imaging studies here, some won't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to proceed to the next example where we're going to pretend like we're actually looking at an imaging study. Oops. Oh, it came up here. That's good enough. Um, let me zoom in. Okay, so here's an example of imaging study. So remember what Brad was saying. Imaging study is essentially the basic subset of information about an imaging study, um, an exam that was done, uh, you know, something like a CAT scan or an X-ray or something along those lines. Um, from a fire EMR, EHR point of view, this gives you the basic information you need to know, but obviously there is much more to it than just that. So that's where you might need to cross into DICOM. Um, the ultimate way of doing so is usually by looking for the endpoint resource which is missing here. This is something we're looking to fix soon, so I apologize that it isn't there, but that's not the only way, so there are other ways. Um, one of the things you're gonna notice is um, in the imaging study resource, you have a link to the um, uh, DICOM UID, the unique ID, uh, so this is it right here. So what you can do is you can take this UID and go talk to the DICOM services using this UID, right? Again, if the endpoint was already there, that makes your life easier because it gives you a, a URL that's just good to go, no questions asked. But if it's missing for whatever reason, this is your fallback, okay? Now, it has an additional information about the study here. So, you know, it'll tell you the number of series, it will tell you the number of instances. You'll notice one thing that's common with DICOM terminology is they call them instances when most people tend to think of them as images. Um, the reason why they use the word instances is because they're actually objects. They may not necessarily all be images. Some of them are objects that store annotations, things that you're, you know, mark up on the image. Some of them may actually be measurements. Some of them may be metadata objects. They're not visible at all. Uh, so it, it's a bit more than just images with DICOM, right? Um, another thing is, of course, um, when you start looking at the series within the study, uh, these series could come from multiple sources. For example, you notice the first one here is a modality CT, so that's a CAT scan. A study in DICOM can have multiple modalities because the patient may have been subjected to a CAT scan and maybe an X-ray or something else, and all these come together to provide a study. Um, you've got more information, like in this case, it's actually listing this, the exact instances within that study. I'm not going to go into that level of detail right now. It's um, it's not really very interesting for this. Let's go back to the PDF. All right, so let's see. I think I had a list of some interesting. Oh, okay. Let's cross over to the DICOM website of things. Oh, and I clicked on that again. That's a mistake. Keep doing that. You know what? I'll get it from my Word document. It's got 
outdated links here, but it'll be easier to work with these than it is to work with. Oh yeah, that's why my Word document is outdated. Okay, um, one thing you'll notice is that in my, AP, in, in my headers, I'm not actually asking for any specific format. Uh, so then you're under the mercy of the implementation of the DICOM web server to decide whether it wants to serve you XML or um, JSON. Of course, you can add a header to say that you want it in JSON. You can add a header to ask for XML. In this case, this is XML. It's good enough for what I need, so I'll just um, highlight this. Uh, the first thing you'll notice with DICOM Web is that it always returns multi-part responses. Um, this is DICOM Web's way of bundling multiple responses in one shot. So in this case, what I've asked for, if you notice at the bottom, uh, at, the, at the end of my URL, I asked for the instances. So I'm asking it to list all the instances within that study. And again, here's that UID that you would have seen in the imaging study resource and fire. Uh, so what that's going to return then is going to return a number of parts, HTTP parts, which correspond to the individual instances within that study. Okay, and this applies across the board. Say, for example, you're actually doing searches for DICOM Web. You know, I'm searching by patient ID, and I'm looking at their studies. It's going to return a number of parts that corresponds to the number of studies that have matched my criteria. Um, this basically works akin to an, an email message because if you if you were to email somebody something with attachments, uh, the way email works is the body of your message is a part, and then each individual attachment is another part. So this is how DICOM Web does it, um, and part of the reason why they do that is because when you are actually retrieving, this is a nice way of being able to give you individual files but in one response. Okay, I'll show you an example of what that looks like in a moment. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the full details of this, but we will highlight a few, um, a few attributes of interest. So DICOM is all about the UIDs. Um, there's a UID at the study level, there's a UID at the series level, and there's a UID for the um, actual instance. Um, in this case, if I highlight this, is it visible enough? I'll zoom in a tiny bit. Sure, go ahead. It really just depends on the implementation, right? It depends on what you're actually using for your DICOM server. In my case, I have a DICOM server, and that DICOM server has a database behind it, and it's just getting that information from, from the database. But I mean, it depends also on what attributes you're asking for, because if you're asking for attributes that are not in the database, some of the DICOM implementations will actually go crack open the files, retrieve these additional attributes, right? Yeah, it, it really just depends. Um, Anyway, so coming back to the topic, so here's the UID of this individual instance. Now, in this case, this instance is actually an image. I assure you it is. So that's the unique ID of that specific image. Okay, another one uh, I, I showed you quickly was the modality. Um, and then the next one I'll show you is the retrieve URL. So kind of like how we talked about the imaging study having endpoints, you know, a ready-made URL that's super convenient for you to go and get stuff. Uh, DICOM Web has got similar things. So you'll usually get a retrieve URL, and this is the URL you can follow to retrieve that DICOM object, okay? Remember though, this is DICOM object, it's not JPEG. Always keep that in mind, okay? Um, there are things like series number, instance number. I won't go through the details of this in the interest of time, but one thing I actually wanted to show you, and this is part of the reason why you always emphasize this is DICOM, not JPEG. Take a look at this. Um, this image is a 16-bit image. Um, a normal image you capture with your phone is an 8-bit image. So this image has a lot more fidelity. It's kind of like when you talk about recording audio in RAW versus you know, transcoding it to MP3 and how you lose that fidelity, right? It's the same thing with those DICOM images. And this is one of the reasons why DICOM still exists because those images have a lot more fidelity and sure, you know, the, the human eye may not necessarily be able to see all these shades of gray, but once you transform the image with things like window level or whatnot, then these actually come into play. Having that full fidelity image makes a difference. All right, 
And now let's try and get to images. So here's a quick example we'll try. I'll just show you. Oh, I remember it. Um, the guide on the website is actually functional. I'm just not using it because copying from PDF is no fun. Um, so this is it here. I've actually just retrieved a DICOM image. Uh, of course, it all looks like gibberish because it's a binary file. So if you process this using the, the proper tools, you'll actually get something you could look at uh, with a, a DICOM web toolkit. But it's images, right? So we all want to see a JPEG. Why don't we go get one? I'll open this one in the browser. Oh, API. Do this every time. So there you go, DICOM image for you. What I've done here is I've actually went to uh, the Wado service and I asked for a JPEG representation of the image. So it will transform it in the background and send me an, a nice and easy JPEG to show. Um, like Brad said, you don't wanna go crazy embedding JPEGs everywhere because for actual viewing, they need proper tools to do that. But nonetheless, for convenience, this option is available, okay? Th there are more guides. Um, there's a bonus exercise I won't cover right now. But before I leave this and give this back to Brad, any quick questions about this? All right, very good. Try it out. It's fun. That's a that's a great question. So, uh, and it's when we say fidelity, I would be careful because it's not about image quality. It's about the amount of inf visual information in uh, an image. Uh, so there are, it's more colors than what you typically see in any sort of image that you'd ever acquire. Um, you, if you think about uh, a DICOM image, you cannot open that in a web browser. You can't. Uh, the portability drops significantly. It's great on a $25,000 megapixel monitor, but I also want to be able to show the patient the images, and I can't bring that around. So JPEGs are, are perfectly fine from a... Uh, a regular image, like browser-based quality, right? Okay. So there's, it depends on the use case. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, yes, there are uh, uh, vendors on the market today that sell uh, diagnostic quality certified by the FDA uh, inside of web browsers. Uh, there's. It's jurisdiction specific and there's lots of caveats. So uh, for example, MAMO studies are very difficult to get certification uh, because of the requirement of three megapixel monitors or higher, uh, which you're not gonna get with a run of the mill browser. So we only have two minutes. So let me just wrap up really quickly, right? So Fire and DICOM, complementary services uh, built to meet the needs of patient-centered care, uh, web-driven architectures. It's secured and protected using web security methodologies, OAuth and other things, backwards compatible, uh, at least for 25 years, and forward thinking as well. If you want to find out more information, you can visit the DICOM standard website, DICOMstandard.org, and learn about DICOM web there, and you can even read the standard about DICOM web. Uh, and then for imaging study, obviously you'd go to the FHIR website. Uh, we do have a DICOM cheat sheet, just like there's a fire cheat sheet, which tells you all about the most common uh, DICOM web uh, calls, methods, and common attributes. Uh, and then there's also a sample payload, so you can have a look at that. Uh, DICOMstandard.org slash DICOM web. Uh, I always say get involved. If you uh, have use cases and you want to know how uh, to approach them, we need, we love, we encourage all of your feedback. Join us on, on our calls on Working Group 20 Imaging Integration or get involved in DICOM. It's free, a number of different ways to contribute. Uh, you can join a working group for free and then you'll get uh, the emails, you can get notification of the calls. We're friendly, we're welcoming, just join and listen in. Uh, there's uh, 31 different working groups where you can learn uh, more depending on what your interest is. As uh, Mohanan mentioned, the data sets that we have, the access to the servers are provided through SIM. Uh, which uh, Society for Imaging Informatics and Medicine, uh, they, they meet annually, they have a hackathon, and it's all about uh, the imaging side of uh, the interoperability as well as lots of other informatics topics. 
So really quickly, special thanks, you know, uh, for contributions uh, to uh, make these slides, HL7 and the fire community, DICOM, Nima Maida, uh, Sim, and then Elliot, who's my other co-chair. So you can find us up at the table upstairs. Uh, and because it's 1140, I guess no time for questions. So find us if you have questions. We'd love to answer them. Uh, look forward to it. Thanks very much, everybody.